an argument thing. I thought that kind of was a
morning, everyone. Good to have you here and those joining us online. Glad to have you with us also. A um, couple of announcements to quick draw to your attention. Just a reminder that our softball team plays this week on Tuesday at um, Mount Zion. So keep that in mind. You have a chance to go see them. Uh, Alvin Horning's Bible study small group meets um, Thursday. But they're going to meet here in the fellowship hall. Um, notice that Pine Grove is offering a hymn sing on Saturday at 7 o'clock if you're interested. And also Operation Christmas Child. We don't want to forget that. If you have an opportunity to buy any of the supplies we need to pack our shoe boxes in the fall, um, you can bring them here to the church and leave them and we'll make sure they get there. Um, also notice that the need for some clothing in Honduras, the sizes and everything are right there. And um, Conestoga School is still looking for two teaching positions, so keep that in mind. Uh, are there any other announcements? Oh, and I didn't forget the next one. I like this one. Every year I like this announcement. I would like the young people to come up front. <laughs> uh, now I want you to stand six feet apart all the way across here, all right? They're looking at me like, do we have to? Come on, wherever you are, get up here. Come on. Whoever wins. And we can have even the leaders, I guess. John and... <laughs> Come on, get up here. Now, no, straight across the front. That's not six feet apart. There you go. I'll get a tape measure. We can measure. There, oh, look at that. How beautiful. All right, so you know that every year I always ask you what was your favorite meal, but I'm not going to ask you that this year because I have something here in this bag that I want you to tell me what it is, okay? All right, the first thing I'm bringing out is this. Grace. grace. It's just like grace, doesn't it? Why is this grace? What's that? It's not the real hammer. It's not the real hammer. Okay. All right. Good. That's something they were learning about tools while they were up there. Uh, let's see here. It's the other one. Oh, yes. Lucky 13. Shield of faith. Shield of faith. Okay. That was they were learning about the shield of faith. And one last one. Let's see here. A compass. What was the compass? Uh... Uh, uh, John? It points to one thing. Who does it point to? Jesus? <laughs> it points to Jesus. Okay. Well, that was good. So what was your favorite meal? Dirt pudding. The dirt pudding. Okay. It's not a meal. Not a meal. It's a meal. It was part of a meal. What else did you like? Anything else that was... Lasagna. 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 Lasag
Good morning. Uh, we'll be uh, rereading scripture from last week. Uh, I think Lance has more to say on that scripture. <laughs> so 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, the, the whole first chapter there, 1 through 10. Um, Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thank you, Patrick. We're in the book of Thessalonians. This is our second week. Um, just to kind of quick get you up to speed with that. Um, this was one of Paul's first letters that he wrote by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wrote probably half of our New Testament, but this is the first one. And he writes, he writes it to this young church in Thessalonica. They are a very new church. They haven't been around for probably more than five to eight years. Um, made up mostly of Gentiles, not Jews. That's a little bit different than some of the other churches. But Paul, when he had been there, he had preached in the synagogue and they threw him out. But he started preaching to the Gentiles and he began. And he encourages them in this letter by trying to give them hope of the Lord's return. The Thessalonican church ends up in severe persecution. Um, if you remember last week where they're located, they're located between Macedonia and Rome, and they're a harbor city, but they were a gateway kind of to the Asia Minor area. So they're a very important city, but as far as the church goes, they suffered immense persecution. Which brings us to that first verse there and the second verse where Paul tells them that he thanks God for them. This is a good church. This is a church that is um, solid, not without persecution, but they're strong. And one of the things that Paul wants to do in this, in this book is to bring them hope in the midst of their suffering. And I shared with you last week that at the end of every chapter... There's a verse about the return of Christ. Now, I know that the chapters weren't there when Paul first wrote, but he intermittently puts in hope in the return of Christ. I wanted to share a little illustration this morning of how, um, how kind of Paul maybe felt about the church. This week, I went up to one of our nursing homes to visit Ed. I think most of you know Ed. He's 96 years old, and... Um, he's been faithful here in our church for a couple of years, but now he's in the nursing home. And I wasn't allowed to go inside, so I went and I wandered around the back of the nursing home. I wandered through all these trees and bushes, and I finally came to his window in his little apartment. And we had to dial up on the phone to talk to each other. And he's very hard of hearing, so he, I don't think he heard much that I said. <clears throat> But he said, hello, pastor. That I got. And then you know what his next words were? I miss the church. And he said, you know why I miss? 
He says, because I pray for it every day, and so therefore I think about it every day. So you're being prayed for every single day by Ed. I thought that was a, a wonderful thing. And then he said to me, he says, so what are you preaching on to the people? What do they, what does God need to tell them? And I said, I tried to tell him, 1 Thessalonians. He didn't get it. I said, 1 Thessalonians. Now, I'm talking through a window on a phone, and he has one of those monitors, and it's very difficult for him to see. And I'm trying to think, how do I tell him what I'm preaching on? So I opened up the Bible to 1 Thessalonians, and I pressed it against the window like that. And he all but cried. He cried. He said, oh, that's a book of hope. He said, I've been reading that. And he says, it's made me look upward, not downward. And um, we went on and had a, a, a nice time together. But I wanted you to know that there's a man who is praying for the church. But he's also praying for the hope, the hope of Christ's return. And you can't go through the book of 1 Thessalonians without <clears throat> experiencing that hope, without catching it. And this little church up in this big city of Thessalonica, needed to know about hope. But if you look at verse 3 in your Bibles, that's where I'm going to be. I want to emphasize verse 3 this morning. Just one verse. And in the different translations, it's almost exactly the same. As the translators have worked on this, there's something in that verse. There's three things that God brings out through Paul. And as I studied Paul, these three things come up again and again and again in all of his letters almost. Look at verse 3. He says, we continually remember who? Remember the church. Remember the Thessalonica church before our Lord, or before our God and Father. Now, number one, what does he remember? Your work produced by faith. Number two, your labor prompted by love. And your endurance or patience inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their faith was alive. And we're going to look at that for just a moment. Their faith was alive. In James it tells us, you want to see uh, my faith? Well then look what I do in James chapter 2. It says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith? I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. And then as you read through the rest of James, he gives examples of, for instance, Abraham in the Old Testament offering up his son Isaac. Abraham steps out in faith, and the action is he's going to offer up his son in a sacrifice. And that's a tremendous lesson to be learned there. But this faith, that Paul talks to the church about, they were beginning to experience what it is to live in faith. Now, I know if you're like me, I, I have a special place in my heart for faith. I want to trust God. I want to believe in Him. I want to have faith in Him. But sometimes I don't know quite where that is. How does that work? How do I look into my heart and see faith? How do I understand faith? In one of other Paul's letters to the Colossians in chapter 1, he says, We thank always God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. But listen to the next verse. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that springs from the hope. And then he goes on to say that is bearing fruit and growing. He repeats those same things, faith, love, hope. But I noticed something there in verse 4 of Colossians chapter 1. It says, because we have heard of your faith. How do you hear it? Faith is something unseen. I mean, it's, it's within me. How do you hear of someone's faith? Well, he goes on and he says that you hear because of the fruit that comes. And the growing that crumbs. And the actions that come. Not before faith, but after faith. And Paul noticed that in the Thessalonican church and the Colossian church. So now the lesson then from just that, that section there, your works produce by faith. 
Notice how it says that. Your works produced by faith. Not works producing faith, but faith producing work. So how about your faith? Is it a living, active faith? Is it an obedient faith? Is it obedience that stems from the joy of your salvation, the love of your Savior, not of obligation, not of legalism, nor of guilting yourself into doing right, or a threat of punishment, or a threat of judgment from God? That's not faith with works. Faith comes out of my joy of serving Him. Think of that for a moment. There are people and there were people in Jesus' time who believed that Jesus was here. I mean, they believed he was there. They saw him. They saw some of his miracles. They might even have believed that he was a good man. Some of them might even believe that he was from God. But there was no joy in that relationship. There was no love in that relationship. There was no hope in that relationship. The reason you could tell is because those people don't carry out that joy and that love and that hope and that faith. That same passage back in James chapter 2, verse 19, James says, You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. So here... Here's the demons. They believe there's a God. They at least shudder in his presence. But the scripture tells us that out of our love and joy and hope in him, we react. We should be reacting in that. How strong is your faith centered in Jesus Christ? I'll bet you if I sat down with any one of you here, I don't know, there's probably 80, 90 of you here, I would imagine if we started talking, in five minutes we'd be talking about the COVID-19. Yeah, right? You all know that. How easy it is to talk about that. Oh, the politicians here, or the doctors here, or this, that. How often do we talk about our faith in that moment? So we can talk about the virus, and yet we're silent about our faith. There's something wrong with that. Something deadly wrong about that. Your faith out of joy should be expressed. <clears throat> People should know about the faith. We watched a video in Sunday school this morning. It was excellent. It was about the temptations of Jesus in the desert. And Jesus showed forth his faith, if you would, by speaking the word. He silenced Satan by just speaking the word. How often do we do that? Your prayer life should be different, I think, than, uh, than maybe it is right now. I'm all for, I, I, I wrestled with how to start up prayer and praise again in our church, because I want us to pray for the needs of our people. But how often do we pray for the unsick? Is that a word, unsick? If it is, I just made it up. If it isn't a word, I made it up. How often do we just pray for each other that God would strengthen your faith and encourage you it's good to pray for those in need i'm please don't get me wrong on that but let's begin to pray for each other that would god would strengthen you in the joy of your salvation that you would be able to speak freely about your faith i read this quote this week um in one of my books and it's here's what it says my works are not my endeavor to obtain favor from God. Or my works do not develop a righteous standing before him. But they are an expression of my appreciation for all the goodness that God has bestowed on me. There's a big word for that in theology. It's called imputing. God imputes his righteousness on you. What that simply means is God gives you the righteous acts to do. By putting your trust in him and by having faith in him, he gives you the works that you are to do. That way you don't have to think up and say, well, now let's see, is it legal to do this? Or 
Is it alright if I do that? You don't have to worry about that because God frames out the work for you. You walk by faith. And all of a sudden, those works become joy. The Thessalonican church was under severe persecution. In fact, Paul and Silas were imprisoned there for a short time. And yet he keeps talking about this hope and joy that they had. Why? Because from their faith, they were able to share the goodness of God. The second point that comes out there, after your works produced by faith in verse 3, it says your labor prompted by love. Same theme again, isn't it? Your labor prompted by love. In other words, love prompts your actions or your labor. The love that is here in Scripture, that word love, uh, most of you understand when I say the word agape. That's the Greek word here, agape love. It's a, it's a self-sacrificing love. It's a love that is bestowed regardless of the result. And I, I guess I believe that love is probably one of the strongest motivators in our world. You know that. Even love amongst couples. And we have a wedding this afternoon, right? And there's love there. And there's a, a motivation. But love is a motivator. And in our faith, what does that do? What does that love do? It produces labor, or it produces good works. Remember the story in the Old Testament? There's a man named Jacob, and he falls in love with this woman named Rachel. Beautiful love story in the Bible. Okay? But through a series of events, uh, his uncle, who's father to Rachel, um, mishandles, not mishandles, but he, he insists that Jacob works seven years for Rachel. So Jacob works seven years to get her hand, and there's a whole longer story. But the one verse that came out, listen to what Jacob said when he was told he has to work seven years for his love. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. That's a beautiful love story, isn't it? We think of that. They had a, or he had a working love. His love for Rachel was so strong that the work didn't matter. 1 John, over and over, when you go through that book, we're not going to go through the whole book, but it talks about putting your actions into action through love. 1 John is a book full of love. There's all kinds of pictures of loving one another and loving God, and there's all these things, but it talks about putting your love into action by doing the works that God wants you to, to do. So, now, what about your love? How much do you love God? Do you walk the walk, or do you just talk the talk? Is your love for God carried out in the wonderful joy of serving, of taking his love and sharing it with other people? John 13, familiar verse, John 13, 34. It says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Have you taken the time to reach out to someone in love? I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying we don't pray for the sick or we don't pray for those that are in need, but have you reached out to people just in love? Have you taken that love, that agape love that God gives, and then I bestow, or that you bestow on somebody else even if they don't love you back? I know why we talk about the virus. Because when I talk about the virus, people talk back to me about it. Oh, we don't like this politician or this doctor. Or, oh, yeah, I don't like, I heard, I heard. And then we get into a conversation about it. Good or bad. Well, we get into the conversation. But if you walk up to someone and you say, you know, God loves you and he died for you on the cross, a lot of times there's a blind face. And so we become discouraged. 
to our shame. When Jesus was here, he loved us so much, it didn't matter. It didn't matter that somebody gave him a blank face. He was put upon that cross to die for our sins because he loved us. And it didn't matter that the whole world at that point was rejecting him. He showed that love by his actions. The last expression there. Your work produced by faith. Your labor prompted by love. And your endurance or your patience inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wanted them to have hope. I really believe, and I, I, I don't have any scripture to prove it, but I believe that in that day when Rome was seeking to destroy every Christian and every Jew that was out there, they thought this is the end. And Christ will return. Remember, the book of Thessalonians was written about 20 years after Jesus had left the earth. And I can imagine them sitting there in church, threatened with persecution and imprisonment. And they're sitting there in church thinking, he's going to come. He's going to come. We have that hope. I hope you sit in church like that. We don't have the persecution that some people do around the world. We're blessed in that matter. But do you have that hope that he's coming? Do you live that way? Do you live as if the next breath takes you into glory? I know I've preached on that topic before about being ready, but I think of that often. Am I living in a ready state for his return? Just think, in the next second, he could be here. And if it wasn't that second, it could be the next second. Could return. That hope should build up inside of us to be want to endure what's in the world, want to have patience waiting for him to return. And it should be something that should show in our expressions. My pastor, when I was about 10 years old, maybe I shouldn't say this, but his son punched me. He did. And I punched him back. Now, we were only about 8, 10 years old, you know. Boy, I was mad. I was mad. And I was storming in church. The pastor looked at me and he said to me and his son, he says, what would happen if the Lord returned right now? I remember that. What would happen? I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know, I'm pretty angry right now. But you know, it was an expression that stuck with me. I know that he's returning, and so therefore it needs to show in my life. I'm not saying that we don't have rough days and it's not terrible and there aren't sicknesses and viruses and all those things. Yes, I know, and they weigh on us. But underlying that, with power and authority, we should have that hope that he's returning. Be excited about that. I was going to pass around a whole bottle of no-dose and get you all high on caffeine so that you'd be excited that he's returning. Some of you are already on it, huh? Okay, but it helps you not sleep in church, I know. But um, James chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Be patient or endure then, brethren, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You probably are watching the fields just like I am around here. I'm thinking to myself, they need a little more rain here, they need a little more rain there, they need to, and you imagine what the farmer's thinking at that point? He has nothing he can do but patiently, patiently wait until the harvest. I'm sure there's mornings that he gets up and says, I need rain, or I need to put fertilizer, I need to do something. But no matter what he does, he still has to wait patiently for the crop to come in. So we wait patiently. We pray, Lord, come quickly. Come, please come quickly. 
But in that patience, in that endurance, we wait. But I often think of that expression that James gives of the farmer. He watched that little seed corn put into the ground and grow, 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 till it tassels and it gets its ear of two of corn on it. He's watching that growth. See, and while we're here on earth, we can watch growth. We can see people come to know the Lord and grow. I think it helps us <laughs> to wait patiently when we see things happening. They had such a hope that it gave them endurance for persecution and for whatever else was going on. But again, the hope has to have, if you would, an action. There has to be a reaction to that hope. Romans 8, 24. Romans 8, 24 says, For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Now in that waiting for it patiently, it should motivate us. Have you ever saved up for something? You, you really wanted a car, a toy, a something, you, and, and each week you put the pennies in the jar or whatever you do to save up for it, okay? That patience that that's teaching you. That's what Scripture's telling you here. Each time we gather for church, it's another penny in the jar, if you would. Each time you share Christ with someone, another penny. Each time you express that hope, it grows and it grows. And as we patiently wait, we see growth. I'm thinking that Thessalonican church probably was taught by Paul to look to heaven for there's your reward. There's where things are truly laid up. I know we all say, you know, you can't take it with you, and that's true in Scripture. There's nothing, I can't take this chair or this microphone or this Bible even with me. But there can be souls that go to heaven with me. There can be people that I've shared Christ with that God intervenes and changes their life, and they go to heaven with me. There's no greater treasure laid up than a soul. There's an interesting scripture about hope that I wrestled with a couple times this week because I was thinking, how do I express hope? How do I give you that hope? 1 Thessalonians is where I went back to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. Verse 8. A very unusual description of hope. It says in verse 8, Since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. Here's our triad again. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. The hope of salvation as a helmet. How do I put on that hope? as a helmet. And the Lord just began to show me all kinds of things that just wowed my mind. Think of the hope of salvation, the hope of being with Christ. If that wraps your mind, if that's what that helmet is, how it guards your mind, and how it gives you those great thoughts, how could that Thessalonian church endure all that imprisonment and persecution and everything that went on. They had the helmet of hope. Their mind was filled with the future events. Their mind was filled with eternity. You could put that helmet on. You can begin to allow that hope to shape you, mold you, focus the way you think even. How do you think about the future? That's, that's what will affect your mind. So, how do we have a strong hope? Hope comes from knowing the future. There's probably not any one of us that doesn't, once in a while, get a little bit interested in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, or the book of Joel. Get a little excited about that. 
I know that if I go into the youth and I say, hey, you ask me any question you want, one of them will sometime ask me, how's the end of the world going to come? What's, what's it going to be like? And we'll talk about the Antichrist, and we'll talk about all that's going to go on, the beast, and all that thing. But when we think of hope, it spurs us beyond what's going to happen to this old world. It goes beyond even the Antichrist himself. It goes beyond the imprisonment of the saints through the ages. It goes beyond the murder of saints. It goes beyond even the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because his death on the cross opened, opened the door to hope. So even, even Christ's death, hope goes beyond that. And I focus then on eternity. I focus on the inheritance. I focus on his coming and taking me into glory. That should be a trademark during this vaccine and pandemic that we're in. <clears throat> maybe this week, maybe just once, try it this week. When somebody brings up the topic of the, the virus and all that goes on, could you just mention, I heard about the helmet of hope. Just mention that and see where it goes. I would think they'd ask you a question about that. I know I did. Helmet of hope? That's the Lord giving you opportunity. If you look at the passage that uh, Patrick read to you this morning, you look at the last verse, chapter, or verse 10 in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Look at that last verse. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from what? The coming wrath. There's hope right there. We wait for the sun to return. Okay? He will rescue us from the coming wrath. What can this world possibly throw at us? And again, I understand that I'm not under persecution like some of our brothers and sisters around the world. But I'm learning from them. I see example upon example. Karen's reading a book about heroes of the faith. It's about uh, women martyrs. And I, I watch those women as they're about to be martyred. What, what possibly could drive them? Why don't they just say, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't want to go any further. But the hope that they have drives them forward. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonican church, he told them, he says, they tell how you have turned to God. If you look at verse 9 in chapter 1, it says, You've turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son's return. See, that puts it in focus now. They turned from this world, from all of its idols and all of its problems. They turned from it and they're facing, they're facing eternity with God. So our little triad here, it's not really little, it's probably one of the greatest triads in Scripture because it's faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope. All three of those things produce in us actions for the world around us, but also peace in the soul. All our works are not based on how we can make God happy. Please dismiss that. Our works are based on an outpouring of what God has given us. His righteousness, now you know the word, imputed upon us. It's placed on us. Your faith can be a remarkable faith. Not just a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader. Your faith can be remarkable. Because God gives you opportunities, not to talk about the virus, but to talk about the hope, that helmet. It's a great opener. Talk about the helmet of hope. <clears throat> Look forward to his return. Look forward to his coming to get us. That should be our hope.
Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this uh, chapter in 1 Thessalonians. Father, thank you for the faith and the love and the hope that you give us. You pile on us. Father, may our reaction to that be of joy. And Father, may we express that to the world around us that needs hope and needs love and it needs faith. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to look at this scripture. We ask now your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. One last thing to close with is it's Ed's birthday this week and I think he's 96 if I'm correct. Maybe you ought to send him a card or something. He's a, he's a good man and he's lonely. Not that all of us aren't in this, but if you think about him, we can get Esther to get you the address. Okay? come and those that are listening lord we would ask your blessing on each one pray that um, your spirit would take your words to our hearts father uh, remove words that i have said but just take your words lord may the hope of salvation's helmet be on us this week thank you for this time we ask this in christ's name amen
How much cord is there? Uh, that was a hundred foot cord, right? How, how much? Right. I'm just wondering if it can be. Yeah, yeah I think that was, the, I think that was the plan. Yeah. Okay. We, we cut, Laura. We cut. Okay. All right.